Now, there's no tricks. It's not animated by eye. No scripts or master controllers. It's This thing is pretty well legit. Rotating this lever moves this piece, which moves that piece, which moves that piece, which moves that piece, which stacks itself all the way up the chain to make a power launch, which is most certainly not how this program was intended to be used, but figuring it out if it's possible anyway is, <laughs> is fun. The program is Toon Boom Harmony Premium, of course. The working file is available on Patreon. And here's the story of how this contraption happened. Good hello, welcome to Onion Skin. Now I get students from all sorts of different backgrounds. The two extremes being those who are like classically trained, like pro proper traditional animators uh, who are trying to figure out how to do all of this on a computer for the first time. And on the other extreme, you've got people who are very tech savvy, but they're still trying to figure out the fundamentals of drawing and uh, animation principles for the first time. The approach for educating these different mindsets is like super different and unique for pretty much everyone. It's always really fascinating to me to see what sort of tools and methods tend to appeal to different kinds of people. Building things with nodes is probably one of the most unpredictable things I find. Some people are terrified of it and some people embrace it because you can get such incredible things going. For aspiring animators who don't like to draw so much, I often encourage exploring how all of these different nodes and things can fit together in all sorts of different ways to essentially discover brand new ways of moving things and let your ideas sort of grow from there rather than starting with a story or a character and trying to go from that direction. One of these students quite recently had the idea of building a scissor lift, right? Because they've been exploring the pegs and some of the constraint systems, deformers and all of that. And they threw together a couple of interesting examples of how this could be pulled off. Uh, this got me really excited. I wanted to give it a go too. So this is one you can follow along with. I'm going to build it probably three or four different ways going from the basic but operational to just kind of stupid and probably longer than if you had actually just straight up frame by framed it, uh, but actually functional, like a real one with sort of rudimentary physics and parenting and stuff. It's gonna be ridiculous. Please enjoy the ride. So the simplest way to get a scissor lift to rise, I'd imagine would simply to be to scale the dang thing, right? So if there are two layers, one of the lift and one of the basket thingy on top, uh, and all I did <laughs> was put pegs on each one. Press F6 to create a keyframe on frame one and on frame uh, what, 18 or whatever. Lowered the basket to the ground and straight up told the other one to scale to the floor. Maybe get a little bit wider. Put the pivot down here on the bottom, by the way, with one of these advanced animation tools. And then it, I mean, it works. <laughs> But that sort of functionality isn't exactly what you come to Onion Skin for. So let's make something just a little bit more clever and something that does a little bit more of the work for us. Rather than just scaling it, I'm gonna replace the scissor function with a two-point constraint. Now, two-point constraint is a really fun node because it lets you have two pivots on the same shape. One on the bottom, one on the top, and then it acts as a bit of an anchor point. As I move this one around, notice it automatically gets a bit of a squash and stretch feature to it. So all I gotta do now is have that parented to the uh, basket here, and this thing will automatically get both of them going. Uh, now, <laughs> the results may be somewhat undesirable, um, but it's a little bit more automated, but still kind of crude looking. For In particular, we have the artwork itself starting to squish. These lines here are thinner when it is crushed down, thicker when it is uh, bigger. Is there a way to sort of maintain that size? Interestingly, yes. This time the lift itself is going to have a single bone deformer. So these are the rigging tools up here, the hammer and spanner, bone mode, and I'm just gonna go tap, tap like this. Just So this is just a single bone, uh, and that's going to now parent to this set. So when I move the bone up and down, we get a similar squash and stretch to what we did before. But deformers have one extra little feature. When you go into the layer itself in layer properties under the advanced tab, there is, uh, no, it's not under that. It's under the line thickness tab, silly me. Uh, there is deformation preserve line thickness. So if I turn that on, uh, then we're going to get the lines staying the same size. It doesn't look it yet only shows up in render mode. So I'm gonna need a color card in here to turn the background white. Uh, and if I'm in render mode, you'll notice this time when I squish it down, the lines are staying the same size. Difficult for us to watch an animation in render mode though. So I'm gonna get a render preview node, stick that underneath uh, and hit 
render frames, if I animate this by, again, pressing F6 at the start, uh, having it stretch up to the top, this one is down at the bottom, uh, make sure I render all those nodes again, see them turn from red to green, and now, well, how about that? So that's starting to work quite functionally if it's keeping all the same size and everything, but I'm afraid this still isn't quite enough because these pieces here are just strokes. Strokes are the only thing that will maintain their size. I can prove it. If these scissor pieces were big and bulky, then the imperfections of this thing squishing start to become a lot more noticeable indeed. So it's time to finally bring out the big guns. Something completely ridiculous. Let's make this thing work for real. Every one of these rivets, an actual parented piece linking to the other one that all sort of bend correctly in real space. Here we go. I've been very excited for this one for a few days. <laughs> So on a blank drawing layer here, I'm going to get the line tool and I'm just going to draw a stroke across like this. Uh, I'm going to make it pretty short and thin to start, the line thickness of only about five. So it's just this tiny little dash in the middle of the stage. Maybe I'll consider turning the grid on so it's just sort of in a good place uh, geographically. Now, what I'm gonna do next is copy and paste that. Notice it goes a little bit down and a little bit to the left. So hold shift and press left and up and it will end up being on exactly the same place it was before. With this new one selected, I'm going to go over to my tool properties here for the black arrow tool and bump up its maximum size up real big, like to the size that I want my eventual scissor lift uh, piece to be, uh, which is probably going to be about this size. Then I'm going to right click it and go to convert pencil lines to brush strokes. Now I'm gonna right click it again. This is converted it from a line to a fill by the way. If I go convert now strokes to pencil lines, that will cause the outline of our new big bulky stroke to itself gain a huge bulky outline. So I need to deselect at this point, select the outer edge to the shape here. So I'm grabbing my new stroke pull that all the way back down. You see how its thickness is now getting thinner, but around that new outer edge, which is great. So now I select this old inner fill, delete that, and I should be left with an outer ring uh, with the original line inside. Because remember, I copied and pasted it to keep that old line. That will be important in just a moment. So I'm gonna get this one a little bit thinner as well. Actually, no, 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 no. I will need to make this one a little bit bigger like this. So that's nice and thick now. I'm gonna repeat this operation one more time so I can automatically generate uh, an inner ring. So I right click that, go convert to brush strokes and then I right click it again and go convert strokes to pencil lines. Uh, and I need to select the outer edge and the inner edge here, and bring their thickness back in. And then I can select this inner section and delete. And there we go, we've got this sort of, uh, yeah, uh, two piece girder looking thing. Uh, so that's a really handy way to be able to make shapes that have rounded edges and are fairly geometrically clean. Uh, now I left this line here in the middle so that we could set up our pivot in a very reliable way. So this drawing layer now is gonna need a peg on it. That's control P. I go up to my advanced animation tools here. I'll select the rotate tool because it's got a nice big, uh, ridicule really easy to find where the pivot is now this is what this old line is for it shows me exactly where the middle of this sort of semicircle is so it just gives me a really good aim uh, like if I was just to eyeball it and guess and it ended up at like here then when I swing it it's like it's an imperfect rotation it has like a little bit of wobble which 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 I don't want I want to try and get it as accurate as I can uh, and this little line here I'll just zoom in and in and in to just get the most accurate guess that I can right about there and give it a test by spinning that around and yeah that's that's pretty good so that's where the anchor will be outer edge and let's choose this one sort of inner edge something a little bit darker yeah there we go uh and we can make the outline something that's a little bit more appealing than black as well can't we Okay, that'll do. We can add some more effects to it later, but we just want to try and get this thing moving at first. So, 
time to get this shape moving. Now follow along, there's some quite interesting steps involved. And now I'm gonna select both of these and go up to the drop down menu at the top left of the node view and go to nodes, clone selected nodes drawings only. This is an incredibly powerful feature because it means that the different pieces can have their own timing, but they share the same drawing substitutions. So that means we can put this over here like this using the uh, position tool line it up with the end of the other line like that um, however they are the same drawing like if i try and change one of them it will do it to both of them now next i need to start parenting these so that they will rotate together because at the moment if i pick the rotation tool each one rotates thus in layer properties with one of these pegs selected, we can see each of the individual parameters, position, scale, rotation. Now rotation at the moment is just a singular number. It works in degrees. You punch in 90, it goes straight up. If I press this little blue button here, it turns it from a static number into a function or a blank tween, you could call it. it you know, it'll go from one number to another. We just haven't assigned what that animation would be yet, but it is an animation now. Uh, right next to it, there's this little drop down menu. If I click on that, I can say copy function link. And then on this other peg, I will go to paste function link. So that means they now share the same rotation data, uh, but nothing else. They can move around independently uh, like this. But if I try and rotate one of them, they will both do it together. How about that? This gets all the more interesting when this peg becomes the parent of this one. So this one will move, this one has to go with it and perform its own rotation, creating this. Pretty cool, sort of collapses in on itself. When it comes to creating like a scissor lift function, however, we need this thing, this first one as it lifts up, when it gets completely vertical, this one needs to already be vertical as well. But if I rotate it up halfway, we see it goes like, kind of all the way around, like it's gone too far in that direction. And if it was sort of packed in this way. So we actually need to like double this movement somehow. I can do that by taking yet another blank peg, putting that in here above the old one. I'm gonna call this rotation doubler. I go over here and press paste function link as well. So all three of them share the same rotation. Now watch what happens now. You see it sort of doesn't really know where to go. It comes back to its fine point, but like it's spinning from a weird spot. That's interesting, right? Well, it's because its pivot is currently here. So let's line up that pivot as well, right up on this little tippy edge here. And now rotating one of them, we should get, there we go. By the time I've gone vertical, it's completely packed into itself, which is great. That's sort of what we want. It's moving twice as fast as it was before. So now the last thing to do is to take this lift piece one here and flip it. So in layer properties again, we've got scale X axis. I'm gonna change that from one to negative one and it flips back on itself. If you wanna do it with the transform tool, you can do so by selecting the peg and then in tool properties with the transform tool selected, there is a flip option here that performs exactly the same action. Check out what happens now. Hey, that's getting closer to what we want. By the time we're vertical, it's vertical as well, but it's still sort of flipping rather than coming outwards like the way it says lift should. Funnily enough, the solution to this is to take our initial peg and flip that on the X axis as well. So that's exactly the same operation, negative one in scale. And now the rotation will do this. It's performing the way a scissor lift should, just sort of lifting up, lifting up almost completely straight from its original destination. What's really fun now is that we've built the foundations of this contraption and we can just double it and double it and double it and it will automatically stack itself. It's really cool. So I've put this one to about halfway here and I'll take these and I can just straight up press copy and paste. So copy and paste actually does a clone. Everything that we have animated is gonna be shared. So you see here on this peg, it has a little plus symbol here, meaning that it's sharing the same rotation as the others. Take this lower peg, connect it up to there. And once it hits the composite, there we go, it'll just keep stacking itself. And I can do this as many times as I want. Stack up here, and it just keeps going. I'll take all three of these, copy and paste them all. And by just hooking up this one, we'll see it continue to stack every time these drawing layers link up to the composite. I'll test by rotating the first one. And indeed it collapses all the way in on itself. It stretches all the way up to being vertical. Quite a lot of distance is being covered now. And the only thing we're animating is just one rotation. And it just knows what to do. I'm gonna take, I think, uh, two more. 
Okay, so now to complete the effect, it needs to be mirrored, right? I'm gonna take this entire set here, copy and paste it. Need a little bit more room. Select both composites, Control H combines them together and reorganize that display. So both of these are in exactly the same spot right now. So if I give this one extra peg and its only purpose is to flip everything, then we get this. So let's get it positioned right, crisscrossing like that. That's a pretty cool effect. And we're nearly there. We're gonna encounter one strange issue when I collapse it. See what happens here. See that? They're like sort of moving a little bit left and right. When it gets fully vertical, they've kind of separated from one another, which is interesting. So what's happening there? That's because our initial one is pivoting from the very base. And if you think about how they sort of like expand and contract, right? They've actually got their pivots in the middle here um, because, you know, they're like bolted through on the, on the intersection if we're thinking about a physical one. Uh, so all we need to do to amend this is take the pivot of only the first one of each one and move the pivot up to the center. And notice how this has actually affected the overall position of our clone. So this one as well, it also needs to have its pivot moved into the middle. It's interesting how it moves the other one. You can find the middle quite easily because you get this like compass hitting north effect on the rotation tool. See how it starts to spin and yeah, that's where it's fighting with zero. And if you wanted to be really precise, back in layer properties, the pivot here, it has X and Y coordinates as well. So I could just punch in a hard zero on both of these and then be guaranteed that I'm on zero. Now then, so if I use this extra peg that we made simply to flip the duplicate with, put its pivot somewhere sensible as well, uh, and slide it over to be crisscrossing as we did before, now they should collapse evenly with one another. And they do. It's interesting how this whole contraption is sort of just like naturally moved across to the side as we arranged certain parts. So let's bring it all back together by taking the two top pegs here, peg those together, and we'll use that as a staging peg where we can position, scale, and do whatever we need with this shape. And this peg here can be used to rotate the entire contraption. So it's starting to look pretty cool now. What else can we do from here? Well, first of all, one of the huge advantages of having pegs and composites is that our hierarchy is independent from our layering. We can rearrange each one of these parts so that they sort of crisscross more like a real one would. So check this out. I want all of the ones going this way to be on top. So I'll just look for the first one of those and rearrange its wire to be at the front and then find the next one. I can select it with the transform tool and then it will highlight. I'll just work my way up, organizing each one of these layers into their new order. And watch how this changes the effect of the pattern. Great, there we go. So I find when it's arranged like this, it tends to collapse in a much more satisfying way, right? So that's all like, it looks quite closed. We can take it in further if we want, but cool. I still got to put the basket on top. I don't need these two composites anymore because everything's sort of interweaved in the way that I want them to be. But I'm going to create a new drawing layer. Call it basket. I don't know what they're actually called. Uh, and I'm going to head over to the drawing view. That's uh, Windows drawing. So I can have a blank space to work with. I'm going to draw this in the right place where I want them to be. Just draw a bit of a square there, sort of lined up at the bottom. Make sure there's no middle. Get these to the right size. And I want this to have the same sort of look as the, the actual springs itself, right? Uh, so I'm gonna get it, give it the rounded edges the same way I did the main ones by bulking up its line thickness like this. So that's made the shape probably a little bit bigger than I want it to be. So I'll shrink it back down again. So all I gotta do now is right click, same method as before, pencil lines to brush strokes, and then right click again, convert strokes to pencil lines. I'll double them up, select my two new lines, bring them back down again and delete. Looks like they need to be much thinner than that. Around about four or even 3.5 for me was what is matching up with these lines. I'm gonna use this inner box for adding a bit of detail as well by heading over to the drawing view. Pick up this box, stretch it out over the outer edges here and, and then copy and pasting the outer basket shell, shift up and left to put it back in the place where it was and shrink it inwards just a bit like that. And then I'm gonna use the cutter tool under the black arrow selection tool to sort of just swipe and trim away these edges here like this. And then on these ones, just to get a bit more of a more interesting embossed shape. Trim away these corners as well. 
And there we go. There's going to be some remnants here on the top and bottom, so it can be worth clicking there and deleting those just to get rid of the doubles. All right, I'll color that. The same scheme. Cool. Now, this is just sort of floating at the moment. It's not going to carry along with the lift itself, right? So it needs to follow along with one of the last ones. Where is one? Here's one. Selected that. Okay, so you need to be stacked off the edge of this. But if I just parented it straight, it's going to end up in a bit of an awkward spot, right? It's become a different size. It rotates with it. All sorts of interesting stuff. So let's give it its own peg, sort of wedge it in there like that. Uh, get that into a good spot and restore it to the position we had when we started. Honestly, I probably should have had this pegged in from the start, uh, but that's no biggie. We can sort that out pretty quick. I have a bit more authority here to be able to adjust this on the fly now as well. But we're still not quite there. Because following one of them in particular, but not both. Just made a little bit more space. Uh, so on this basket, we need it to move up, but we don't want it to rotate, right? So we need to go to the constraints section in the node library and find transformation limit, spread that in, and in its layer properties, it has every parameter type with 100 as a, you know, 100 being a percentage. Uh, so it is fully on. So if rotate became 0%, then it will stay at a particular rotation. So this rotation is wrong, but it is not moving we also only want it to move up and down so i'm going to turn any translate x down to zero as well so let's correct its rotation here on its own peg counteract any of the effects it's being given and we've got one last hurdle to overcome here and that is its speed more or less because notice that these parts they're sort of like outside of the basket but then they sort of like eat into it. It doesn't actually feel like it's carrying it very much. So it actually, we actually need the first half of the rotation doubler just to get it up that halfway. So I'll copy and paste that, thread it in here. And now one last time to amend uh, the basket peg, sit that on top here. And hopefully now rotating any of our rotation pegs should get it to sit just in place. And it does, fantastic. So what to do from here? I actually want to have a remote control for a system like this before we give it any compositing or whatever. So I'm going to press Control R to create a new drawing layer and call it Lever. Okay, and Control H to make a new composite. So both the whole forklift and the lever will go into the same composite and that goes back down to my display. Uh, I'm going to get a different color because like my black is like a dark red here. So get a copy of that and make it an actual regular dark gray and off here in the corner I'm gonna draw a bit of a stick with a circle on the end so this is gonna be a bit of a lever cut a tool to trim off that edge new color that's a lighter gray and paint bucket to fill both of them so my goal here is if I give this thing a peg and put its pivot sort of in the lever somewhere that when I rotate this, it will be my control for the for the whole thing, right? <laughs> it's pretty fun. So if I go back to any of my other rotation pegs and find that angle Z again, and go copy function link, head down to our lever, even though it's not connected to anything, it'll still work, right? So you go angle Z and then paste function link. Uh, and now whenever I click on this thing, I can rotate it like this. That will work. I was predetermined the angle for me, so maybe I should amend this on the uh, uh, drawing level. And I can create a, a bit of a case for it as well if I want to put it inside a uh, machine or something like that, which I think I might. So like fully extended will be down and then fully collapsed is about up. So it doesn't need to move very far, does it? So I'm going to do just that with another composite underneath the lever and another drawing layer. I'll call this lever case. Uh, it'll have a peg as well, which will be the parent of the lever. And this will use that gray to draw another uh, box that sort of holds the whole thing. And I'll draw a circle inside of it like this. I could turn the light box on here with this little light table to fade out everything else so I don't get distracted. 
Uh, and once I'm happy with how that's lined up, I'll use the cutter tool to trim it off from the inside so it becomes more of a static piece. The light gray to fill that. Uh, so now that this is the parent with that peg, uh, I can move this around wherever I want. Uh, but whenever I select the lever itself, that's going to be the thing that controls the scissor lift. <laughs> this is pretty fun. So last thing, I'm going to do a bit of compositing. So it's time to get rid of uh, this line through the middle here. And that's easy enough to do. I'm going to select any one of these drawing layers and head over to the drawing view itself. So remember, all of these are drawing clones. If I alter any one of these drawings, it'll do it to all of them. So what happens if I erase one? Whoa, you can actually get some pretty interesting effects here, huh? Maybe you want to decorate yours by turning on uh, the repaint tool here so it can only draw inside of things that you've already done. Uh, but I'm going to select this line here and I'm going to cut and move down to the underlay sublayer and paste it there. Uh, just because there it's going to be invisible. It means I don't actually have to delete it. <laughs> I can just sort of have, have it there as safekeeping. Meanwhile, this middle section here, I'm going to cut that as well and move it down to the color art sublayer. So then I can divide these and do different things with them. First things first, I want to cast some shadow down from the basket onto the uh, these first two here. So to do that, I'm going to put a composite underneath the basket, have two threads that connect into it. I'm going to press enter here and type in apply to get my apply peg transformation. Hold alt to thread it into one of those. So it goes into the right hand port and then down through the middle. Control P to create a peg for it. And this actually allows me to have any image be in two places at once. So I can just move it straight down like this. I'm going to use this second one as a mask against the other pieces. I'm going to get a color override node. So I'll type in over, we've got color override here. Hold alt to thread that in on its right hand ports as well. And in layer properties for this, I'm going to select this yellow here, press the arrow to send it across and we see we've got a swatch that says new. I double click on that. And I'm going to use this eyedropper here to sample the dark red outline color. And then it turns into a bit of a cast shadow shape, right? But it needs to only appear inside each one of these respective scissor parts. So that one and where's the other one? This one. Oh, it's all the way over there. So these two. <laughs> so I'm going to take a cutter out, thread it through here. These two pieces are going to be used as a mat. So they get a second to a second thread each going into this composite. And then that goes into the cutter. It removes it from where both of those goes are. So I double click to invert and then it appears on the inside of each one. Let's test by pulling the lever. Hey, there we go. Now here's the interesting bit. Maybe I want each one of these ones that are on top to be casting a similar shadow onto these back two sets here. So I cut a part of the edit earlier where I actually deleted these two composites and brought them all together. Um, and because I actually need them back. <laughs> Uh, so if you happen to catch that and did it as well, uh, just create another composite here. I'm just going to pull these threads across in the same order uh, until I've collected all of the background ones from the stack. And now the whole thing's going to happen again. So this color override, even though it didn't show on the basket, I'm going to bring in the dark yellow shade across and sample the dark outlines again, uh, because we're going to use a version of this same system from Goethe's to Goethe's. So let's tidy this up a little bit. We can actually group these three, call it shadow effect, and make a copy of it. So let's figure out what each port does. When we make a group, everything that didn't go anywhere actually just gets given one. So this one on the left is redundant. I'm gonna pull on all of these threads until they disappear. So we've got the image itself, the one that goes to the mat, and a peg. So first let's plug this into the bottom composite. Then I'll press Control P to create a peg so we can move the things around. So the shape that we want to turn into shadows is the front row, and they need to be masked by the back row. Then I'll use this peg to shift it down and to the left a little bit, I suppose. Maybe it doesn't even need to go to the left. Uh, and I'll get a second thread of the back ones to thread underneath it all. There we go, look at that. That's given it so much more depth, that's really cool. Let's try it out. All right, 
So you see there, because we've used the apply peg transformation to create the shadow, it actually updates a little bit dynamically. See how it sort of collapses in. See how the shadow always points downwards in particular, even as these bits start to creep in. If we wanted to be really stupid, we could do this on every individual uh, girder shape, which is why I separated it onto the color art four. So I'm gonna get a composite in here, just under the first one. I'm going to find uh, this shape here by clicking on it, then press O in the node view. And I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna put a composite in here and then group it with G. I'm gonna call this inner shadow. I'm gonna head inside this group. So all we've got is a composite and we can spread this out. And this is gonna be like our play area to be able to create an automatic inner shadow. It's gonna be very similar to what we've done just before, but rather than color overrides, we're just going to use the sub layers because we split the inner side into the color art. So I press on filter here in the node library, open that up and there is a section called isolate. Uh, so this actually has nodes for each of the four sub layers. So if I take out a line art and a color art here, I can separate those and look at each one like this. If we get a line art, then we see it with a hole in the middle. So what I wanna do here is get yet another apply peg transformation, thread our color art through it, put a peg on that, nudge it down just a little bit as we did the others. If we wanted to be really clever here, rather than using that peg, if we use this one, it would have the same amount of like down as the other ones. Uh, I probably don't want to do that though. I want to have a little bit less. So I'll have a fresh peg for here. Push it down just a tad like this. And I'm going to get a second thread from the color art straight down to the composite. So you can sort of start to see the shape we're going for here. But lastly, we need to go back to the favorite section, get out a cutter. It's going to get threaded into the underneath that raw color art one and it's gonna be masked by this apply peg transformation, leaving us with only that trimmed section there. And then just as we've done earlier, that will get a color override underneath, but we select that darker color, send it across, double click it, and I drop a sample it to the darker black color. Now, finally, I just need yet another color out thread to go down to the very bottom and plug the gap. And now we have an automatic inner shadow for that edge. Because I'm feeling greedy and this is all inside one group, I think I'm gonna do the same thing for the outer edge to give it a bit of a shine. So here, I'm gonna go back to the drawing view again. And I'm gonna use the select by color tool to select these uh, darker lines. Say cut, go up to the overlay and paste. And then back on the line art, now that this is separated, we're also gonna to need to go to the isolate section once again to choose an overlay to bring the line art back on top. And I'm gonna do more or less the same thing again, again. Apply peg transformation from the line art down to underneath the overlay with the peg. This one is going to shift a copy of the line art a little bit more to the left, I think so that when I put a cutter on this one, which will also be a line art, unhook this apply peg transformation to put it into the mat of the cutter and put it on top of the standard line art. If this is starting to get a little bit confusing to look at, you can isolate what you're seeing by pressing Control Y to bring up a new display, put that into the thing that you wanna see and then up in the top toolbar here, right click, uh, and make sure display is active. Then you get this drop down here and you can choose your new display, display nine in this case. Now I can see uh, what that is actually doing. So it's starting to look pretty good. Now uh, I'm gonna need just one more color override here. Open that layer properties with the brighter yellow changing to white. Uh, all right, so I don't need this thread anymore. Remove that, replace it with this one and my finished shape looks like that. Cool, so I'm starting to get quite a bit of dimension to it. And these two uh, apply pegs that are doing this shading for me means that it's gonna update its angle automatically. I'm gonna change back to the display I was using before and look at the difference it's made. Make sure I delete this display before I do anything else and get this a little bit tidy because like, oh man, we're gonna get some interesting results when we start copying this. So I'm gonna call this uh, 
shade dot P and this one highlight dash P so when I can come back to it later. Now notice when I click on the peg itself in its layer properties, I moved it down a bit to the left. So those have become grayed out. So if I was to copy and paste this, that position is gonna be shared across everything, just like the rotation that we manually copied and pasted the function of before. Same thing with the shade. This thing has had its Y axis moved, but the X will not be cloned. So I need to press this button here to make sure that that's going to be uh, cloned as well. If not, uh, you get the same effect by just sort of like wiggling it around like if this gets moved then it automatically creates the function for us but because i only strictly moved it up and down that one got left out anyway what that means is that this group is now copy pasteable it can be replicated across all of the other shapes so if i just copy and paste that normally rather than duplicating um, it means that i can update uh, the parameters for all of these together so i'll just copy and paste a bunch of these groups across each one and if for whatever reason I turn out to be unhappy with how the light's working, see that? All of their positions update at once. But that's strictly for these positions here. If I decided to change the color, the color override is not animated. It would be manual for each one, unfortunately. Okay, I put that onto every piece now. It's starting to look a lot more complete and nice. Lastly, I want to do it to the basket as well, but I'm not going to really get much results here because currently the basket is all drawn on one layer. I'm going to open the camera and the drawing view side by side so we can see this one update in real time a little bit better. Uh, but the rule was that we put these shadows on the on the color out sub layer. So I'll paste that there and we automatically get given our shadow. And if I remove the line art, the color out selection tool and cut that onto the overlay, then we get a bit more room for the highlights as well. Cool, that's starting to look pretty nice. I've gone ahead here and polished things up a little bit more, uh, just visually, but also functionally. I uh, here have gone through the gearbox, splitting it into its sub layers so that I can use both strokes or paint inside with the brush. So I can be a little bit more careless about where I slap some paint down and get it into those shapes. I used a color selector here to extract only the whites and apply just a glow to those. I could use some of the pre-existing geometry here to get shadows onto the lever and just using the show strokes mode to be able to get different lines and shapes to, <laughs> yeah, just make it anything more than just being a gray square. I got a tweet um, from Timbrim themselves demanding that this, this should be a boxing glove, right? Obviously, such a good idea. Uh, so that's being roughed in now uh, on the same sub layer, but with a different color. Uh, so then after using uh, my brush tool to my pencil tool to get the different shapes in, I was able to use the select by color to remove the pre-existing blue and then the color tool to trim off different edges. Now that it's all sort of assembled and working, I wanted to be able to get it working with different sort of swaps. So I've gone in and re-engineered some of the back end to help it be scalable at different uh, sizes. So inside each one of these uh, sub parts, I've brought in the middle port of their apply peg transformation to bring it up to the top. This allows the effects to scale naturally with the topmost peg while still retaining uh, the angled rotation uh, from some of the lower ones. Uh, from the transformation limit, which stopped things moving side to side, I've refined that a bit more now. So the boxing glove will sort of just more naturally move where the shape does uh, and I can move between different drawing substitutions as well, whether it be the glove or the scissor lift or anything else that I feel like adding onto it. So this has become a very versatile piece now that can be used in different ways and animating just that one lever up and down is going to control the whole thing, making this really efficient to work with. Uh, so now that this file is nice and tidy, that has been prepared, all good for any of my faithful Patreons. Thank you for your support. That file will now be there available for you to duck in and have a bit of a tinker, pull things apart, see if you can make something else out of this. Or if you've been following along with this tutorial and need to have a close a look at how this is really working that will be available to you thank you for joining me on this ridiculous journey that it took oh my goodness it took ages to get this working the back end of this like 
figuring out how to get all of these pegs to stack in a way that they actually rotate in the way they should, like, it seemed like it was pretty straightforward, in my head at least, but it took like three hours of just tinkering until it finally collapsed the way it should, and then took another while to like replicate it reasonably so that I could, you know, record it. So that's available to the Patreons as well. The what on earth is happening working file where there's lots of half finished versions of this where you can pull on the levers and see all of the other weird ways that they work. I wonder if you can decipher what might be happening depending on if a part is flipped, if the rotation is doubled in a certain spot, wherever the pivot is, they all had such radically different effects on the final result. I hope you get something out of that. Okay, bye.